Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled, It's a Fracking New World. We're grateful to Dr. Charles Mason from the University of Wyoming for today's timely discussion. Now, first, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations, along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website at www.iae.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for our, our speaker, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and type your question. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of this webinar to address your questions. And now I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Charles Mason, Professor, Department of Economics at the University of Wyoming. Charles, over to you. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to share two pieces of work today with Tim Fitzgerald. Uh, we're gonna spend much of our time talking about uh, a, a project that we've been working on for the last several months. And then towards the end here, I'll use this to dovetail into a paper that we recently published. These are both papers to do with, uh, broadly speaking, intellectual property rights associated with hydraulic fracturing. So let me start off here uh, by uh, showing you, um, see, I think this is now up, yep. Okay, I wanna, I wanna sort of set the, the foundation for, for Tim's talk. Uh, so the, the background to this is that we're thinking about a relatively new technology. It's, it's really only been broadly deployed for roughly speaking about two decades. And with this in mind, uh, because this is a new technology, you would expect there would be innovations that would emerge. How does that knowledge disseminate? Who's associated with disseminating the information? And what kinds of side effects might there be? So just to... Uh, kind of set this up here. Uh, here's a, a plot that depicts over the course of the last 20 years, the number of articles in the Journal of Petroleum Technology that have keywords associated with hydraulic fracturing, fracking, tight gas, tight oil, stuff like that. Uh, and you can see that they're relatively uh, modest until maybe 2005, after which they start to <clears throat> increase quite uh, dramatically, and then kind of flatten off around 2014 or so. At the same time, the number of patents associated with fracking were really small up until 2013, 2014, when they started to, to creep up, and they really exploded after 2015. So there's an interesting pattern here uh, about a temporal pattern about the way that that information is disseminated originally. Uh, through uh, scholarly publications, uh, and then after that, uh, by way of patents. And this kind of raises an interesting question about who is disseminating the information. So to get at this answer here, I've split out two cohorts of service companies, uh, the top three service companies, Halliburton, Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, and everybody else. Uh, so the scholarly publications associated with the top three companies are the solid line with triangles. Uh, for everybody else, it's the dashed line with triangles. And the, the pattern here for the top three companies is really quite similar to the pattern in the preceding slide. That you start to see an increase uh, right around 2005 or so. It peaks around 2014, 2015. And then after that, uh, scholarly publications are not nearly as important. At the same time, the number of patents, and here there's a, there's a fine point, maybe Tim will speak to this perhaps in the Q&A. If he doesn't, we'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, but the, the number of patents associated with fracking that are tied to top three companies really start to increase quite dramatically after 2014-15. Um, and again, you see 
not so much traction for the other companies. So the, the, the general theme here seems to be there's an interesting uh, temporal sequencing, publications first, patents later, and it really seems to be driven by these big three companies. Right? And so that, uh, that kind of raises a host of questions, some of which have been touched on in the literature. Uh, and I'm gonna let Tim take it from here and, and kind of explore what all this means. So Tim, over to you. Thanks, Chuck. Uh... I'm going to um, start at the beginning. Uh, so hydraulic fracturing kind of first first strolled on to the to the scene, uh, and it was patented right away by Halliburton, one of uh, the leading uh, oil field service companies. Seventy years later, uh, and you know, curiously, they they were happy to patent this process early on, and then used it for decades without really any additional patenting. And it was regularly used uh, in a variety of different settings. Um, you know, there's this there's this sort of creation myth that has arisen, and, and myths are useful if they're not always uh, fully accurate. But this this one is is pretty accurate, and it was that George Mitchell and Mitchell Energy uh, managed um, to to develop a new method to stimulate production from unconventional, you know, or tight geological horizons if you if you go down the rabbit hole on this myth you you know that there's this one well the sh griffin number four well in in texas and that was where it really started in 1998 uh, mitchell had been working tweet trying to tweak this technology for some number of years there were other firms that were similarly trying to innovate around the same time uh, in different places but um Mitchell has managed to uh, kind of capture the creation myth. One of the things that I find most interesting about this, there's a, there's a little uh, side conversation with Mitchell uh, in, in a biography that, that came out about him in, in which he explicitly acknowledged one of the reasons that they started tweaking the, the formula for hydraulic fracturing uh, was because they were really angry about the high markups being charged by service companies uh, for frac gels at the time. And so they, they replaced these high markup gels with water, which was cheaper. Uh, and then they ended up figuring out how to make that work. And, and uh, that discovery and the combination of that discovery with other related technologies led to a, a massive increase in the amount of treatments uh, that were applied year by year. Uh, and you can see from, from 1998 here, when the sort of creation myth says this started, we had a, 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 an historic increase in the number of, of sort of frac jobs or frac treatments each year in the United States. I, I always think this is a, a interesting chart to think about. Every time you see a, a study that uses an indicator variable to say when um, when fracking started, you know, and usually it's about 2008 or 2009. Uh, this this chart gives you some notion that uh, there was actually a lot of innovation and experimentation going on uh, before that time. Uh, and this rapid increase came with this sort of realization that the innovations had proceeded to a point that this was. Uh, widely ac applicable uh, to a number of different geologies, and and from uh, Mitchell Energy was a, was acquired by Devon, and and uh, um, nobody had a patent on hydraulic fracturing or this new form of hydraulic fracturing, and so it, it really took off around the country, and that set the stage for a wide variety of. Uh, chances to learn by experimentation, right? And to tweak uh, the formula and tweak uh, all the different uh, parameters of, of a frac job uh, to try to increase production. It's, it's quite straightforward to um, document the increase in per well productivity. Uh, some of that may be attributable to uh, 
you know, changing frac treatments, some of it may be attributable to, to other factors. Um, but it, it has certainly transformed the landscape for uh, first natural gas and, and then oil. If we wanted to think about how we would measure um, uh, a fracturing job, we could think about just the inputs into a fracturing job. And this is just a, a representation compares to two different frac jobs. Um, you know, there, there's a base fluid, which is usually water. There's propent, or a lot of times that's sand, but there are fancier different kinds of, of propents and, and different sizes. Uh, and those kind of make up the second largest chunk of a particular job. And then up at the, the very top of the pyramid here, there's a kind of a cocktail of um, additives, chemical additives that get a lot, they're very salient in um, the minds of environmental concerns and community concerns. They're small relative to uh, the volume. Uh, and so there, there's been a lot of work, you know, you could think about these two fracks, the one, uh, on the right-hand side here is a little bit uh, larger uh, in terms of volume, um, has a little bit less sand in it. And you could think about across thousands of different frac jobs, you can think about making these kind of comparisons. Uh, it turns out that Chuck and I have actually done that. Uh, and so we have uh, a paper that is, uh, out out now in, uh, in environment and development economics. It has basically six, uh, six empirical results as kind of thinking about fracks as input op an input optimization problem. You know, as you have more water, you don't need as much toxic stuff, but as you try to increase the amount of sand you're gonna, or propent you're gonna deliver in a given amount of fluid, then you have to start adding things to the mix. Uh, and it turns out that the kinds of things you need to add to the mix to get more sand into uh, into the borehole turn out to be the, the kinds of things that are going to provide gels or cross-linking gels, friction reducers. Those kinds of things tend to be the more toxic kinds of things. But we, we document very heterogeneous use across different operators uh, and service companies in the uptake and use of uh, toxic additives and of, of trade secrets. Um, but in the period uh, during which, or the period we investigated was 2010 to 2013, we found uh, some evidence of uh, increasing use in the toxicity of uh, additives. But what we really walked away from it from is that there is uh, an awful lot of variation in the different kinds of recipes that different uh, firms use and, and that left us with this kind of puzzle to try to think about how we should think about learning about how to use this new technology over the past couple of decades. Uh, there have been a, a number of studies in, in this, uh, this vein. I would uh, set this up by saying that I think, you know, there, there may be four big ways to think about a big channels you can think about learning going on. One is uh, sort of experiential learning. Uh, and I think that's where this literature started. Uh, Tom Covert, I think was, was the first person uh, looking at this and he, he did a, a study in uh, North Dakota and found that, that firms were learning through experience and the more uh, wells that they managed to fracture, the better they did. Uh, but he, his conclusion was that they did it sort of passively and they didn't experiment uh, as much as they might. Um, I was actually, I, 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 did, I then did a study and I was a little bit more interested in trying to attribute the gains, but again, very much in this sort of experiential uh, vein of learning. And so not just single firms learning by themselves, but the possibility that there would be learning and partnerships between operators and the service companies that were actually providing uh, the fracks for them uh, and, and started to be interested in, in uh, 
you know, we found, found, some, found some evidence of, of some kind of uh, pairwise, pairwise learning, um, but that producers rather than the service companies were managing to uh, capitalize those gains. Um, a second channel for learning is what you might think of as, as social learning. Um, and uh, Rob Fetter and uh, Chris Timmons and Andrew Stack, and I'm afraid I'm probably forgetting someone to whom I apologize in advance, um, have put, you know, done a really careful study of social learning after uh, disclosure laws uh, changed in the state of Pennsylvania uh, and, and thought that there was a lot of kind of learning by copying rather than learning by doing. Uh, and they find pretty strong evidence of that and they find convergence via imitation of frack recipes. And, uh, and what's really significant for that is that once firms are imitated and there is copying that goes on it, uh, this social diffusion slows down the pace of innovation, right? And so that's a, that's a kind of a top line concern from the point of view of technological adoption. Uh, in the work that I'm going to talk about, and, and Chuck actually teased here off the top, uh, we got interested in whether there was a third channel for uh, dissemination of information, and that was through these sort of intentional outward-facing displays of technical prowess. Uh, and and we, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about patenting and then also uh, the scientific publication process, which, which might just be a way to signal to potential partners uh, that, that you are a really, I, I guess, you know, as uh, for, for the academics on the call, right, we can all kind of relate to that sort of signaling motivation uh, for, for publication, uh, but it may actually also reflect uh, differences in the amount of, of intellectual property that's being created. Uh, for the record, the, the, fourth, the fourth channel that we've, we've thought about is uh, that there's actual embodied knowledge in individuals who are moving around, uh, moving around the industry. So one of the questions is, has there been convergence or, or a consensus, I guess, about what the optimal frack recipe is? And I'll start off with a, a figure uh, because because fracks are uh, you know lots and lots of uh, additives, lots and lots of different inputs that go into a frack, and then many more possible inputs. It's a very uh, high dimensional problem. Um, Fetter et al. kind of figured out that the elegant way to to solve this problem was to use a, a, a Jacquard index, uh, which is going to just kind of compare the similarity. And uh, I guess the summary of this, of this chart is at least for the data that they had in Pennsylvania, uh, they, they found that within operators, uh, fracks were pretty similar, but even uh, across operators and between operators, there was convergence over time. And so they kind of have this evidence that at least where they were looking at it, they're there has been this sort of convergence to a kind of uh, optimal frack recipe over time. Uh, Chuck and I had some different data and this is from Wyoming. We find just a, a real polarization in terms of, uh, we, we see, this, this is an area that's actually been using hydraulic fracturing for more like uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, much, much longer history. And so you might think if there was going to be convergence, it would have, would have already happened, but, but we just don't see that. Uh, we don't see this, this kind of similarity. We see different kinds of, of technologies uh, being applied. And as we dig into that, we find this is a, an area where there's a very small number of operators, there's a very small number of service companies and it is uh, ripe for kind of strategic interaction and uh, each service company's uh, kind of selling their own brand, if you will, of, of fracks and, and some of the operators 
have a more or less exclusive relationships and uh, others, others try to shop around uh, a bit more, but certainly this, once, once we found this result, we were sort of interested in saying, well, maybe, maybe there's a little bit more going on here than the kind of simple social learning story and everybody finally kind of figures out what the right thing to do is and, and uh, plows ahead from there. So if, there, if there's some learning going on, one of the really interesting questions for us is kind of who is doing it and uh, the accumulated evidence across the, the studies I've mentioned uh, and the additional empirical work that we've been able to bring to bear suggests that the producers, the operators, the EMP companies are managing to uh, capture the lion's share of these gains. I think there are three reasons why that uh, makes a bunch of sense. There's, there's this sort of what I call an institutional channel. The operator has final authority on a well. And so it kind of makes sense that they would call the shots. Uh, you know, there's this sort of direct evidence, you know, direct econometric and, and statistical evidence that this is in fact what's going on. Uh, and then there's this sort of indirect evidence that over time and, and particularly in the last few years, we've seen uh, a handful of producers begin to provide their own fracks. They're no longer hiring the contractor. They've decided to sort of vertically integrate what was traditionally a separate uh, industry. You know, I, I think if you, if, you, if you go back 20 years to when uh, fracking was just starting to, to really be uh, a, a really important technology, there, there was still a possibility to sort of have this turnkey service contract uh, where you, you know, if you're an operator, you could call up one of the, the big service companies and they would, uh, you know, come and, and do what it took to get your well flowing for you. Um, you know, we, we also, uh, in, in our most recent work, Chuck and I have some pretty clear evidence that the large service companies help the smallest operators the most. Um, but, and, and as you, as you, just look at more experienced and larger, more sophisticated operating firms, uh, the benefit of having a really technically proficient partner uh, decreases. And, and that actually is maybe not that surprising. Uh, so we're just the same, we we're glad we we're glad to see uh, a result that, that made sense like that. Um, there's much more of a, a tendency of some of these big operators to, to treat the frac market much like uh, a spot market. And because we're sort of thinking about the underlying intellectual property and kind of who knows, who knows how, to, how to tweak and innovate this, this technology, you know, take, take this alongside the, what I call the indirect channel here and the transition uh, as producers are providing their own fracks, maybe they're doing this to try to protect uh, their own IP uh, and, and prevent uh, a service company from getting a uh, nose under the tent. I'll, I'll come back to that idea here in a little bit. You know, at the same time, we have uh, a handful, a small handful of, of the big operators who are basically locked in exclusive or near exclusive relationships with uh, service companies to provide pressure pumping. Um, but uh, to, you know, so, so there's, again, we're seeing the kind of heterogeneity where uh, our most recent work, we've taken a kind of a nationwide sample. And so, so there are different things going on in, in different parts of the country. And I'll, I'll come to that here in a minute. Um, but in general, the trend has been to treat uh, pressure pumping spread more like a uh, perfect substitute and that's going to have some important implications for the structure of the oil field service sector. And so we start from a point, uh, there was a, a paper in 2011, just as shale gas was starting to really gain prominence. And it, it uh, highlighted the concentration in service sector, said so there was 75% market share for the top three firms. Uh, as Chuck said, that's Halliburton, Schlumberger, uh, Baker Hughes. And uh, this, this chart here just shows you si since that time, we've, we've seen a, a pretty 
there was a pretty big uh, increase in the number of active firms in pressure pumping. We measure this uh, just, we use uh, primary vision data. So uh, just trying to measure how many um, frac spreads there are, you know, the think about a drilling rig as being able to go provide uh, drilling services for an operator. Frac spread basically does the same thing uh, for the completion uh, work. And there's just a big increase in the number of new firms that are active in the United States. And there's, um, and we could, we could plot out the declining um, concentration over time as a result of this entry and, and this sort of erosion of market share of, of those big occupant firms uh, that started off. That said, there's still a lot of, um, places, and, and this is just a table that shows you based on different states around the country where there, there are still uh, pressure pumping suppliers who have sort of dominant market power. The notable um, exceptions on this list are some of the most active drilling markets. So Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota after 2011, Pennsylvania, none of those areas um, have evidence of concentration in pressure pumping, but there are other important producing areas. I know Chuck has a soft spot for Wyoming. Uh, and, you know, the, even, but even New Mexico, which is an important producing state, there's, there's evidence that we've had uh, substantial concentration in this, in this service sector. We know that there's a lot of entry uh, and we might think that some of these occupant firms are very interested in trying to maintain their dominant market position to, to sustain those markups that George Mitchell uh, was complaining about uh, in the 1990s. So connected to our kind of first story about experiential learning, uh, we've thought about how market occupants have reacted to this entry. And as Chuck kind of teased off the top here, the occupant firms uh, have changed their strategy and tried to expand uh, their IP footprint. Remember that Halliburton had, had patents on hydraulic fracturing as a process uh, as early as 1949, didn't uh, continue to try to have patents keeping up. Uh, over time, um, but starting uh, around 2000, we saw a lot more scientific publication uh, and then uh, a really market shift starting about 2013, 2014, certainly by 2015, the, the scientific publications uh, tapered off for the service companies uh, and they really poured a lot of resources into uh, patenting activity. I call it patenting activity here because we looked at both uh, patent applications from a service company, but also uh, patent assignments where they were trying to buy up uh, related patentable technologies uh, to try to, uh, you know, I guess compound their, their intellectual property uh, portfolio, if you will. Um, and, and we don't see anything like this for operators. So it's interesting that we have these experiential gains accruing to operators um, for the most part, but they don't play in this, this uh, space of trying to um, capitalize on intellectual property that they may have. Now, I mentioned a little while ago that maybe, maybe the reason service companies are able to promote um, their own intellectual prowess or technical prowess is because they're actually just sort of stealing it from operators. And that's why operators wanna quit hiring service companies and, um, and, and do it themselves, basically. They, they, they don't need to advertise. They, they can show their shareholders uh, or residual claimants, the increased production. But uh, the change over time has, has put entry 
on um, on the servicers. And I got a couple of charts here just to kind of give you a sense. This is this is just the academic publications and uh, after actual academic and this uh, outlets and then the sort of uh, potpourri of other um, uh, other other affiliation service companies have a, a enormous um, lead here in terms of trying to use this channel to signal their technical technical prowess either to potential customers or or to other people in the industry um, independent operators who drill most of the wells in the United States are you can barely see them down here at the bottom of this um, chart the the large international companies and the um, the national oil companies have have a little bit bigger profile that may be something that Chuck wants to touch on here uh, in a little bit might be clearer to see this in terms of the share uh, and so the the service companies have this uh, pretty dominant uh, share in that's the second tier from the top there is the service companies, you know, they're, they're publishing almost 30% of uh, all of the publications in any given year in the, in the kind of early mid 2000s. Uh, and that tapers off towards the end, partly because academics uh, begin getting, getting very interested in this. I think that lines up pretty well with the, the timeline uh, that I laid out earlier. But um, you know, one, one of the ways that uh, Chuck and I have thought about this, you know, it's pretty cheap and easy to, to put out an academic paper. Uh, again, the academics will sympathize with that, but it may be a very um, valuable signal to buyers. It, it's sort of like advertising. Uh, this activity is absolutely concentrated amongst the big three service companies, the small entrance service companies, uh, anybody who knows Wilkes Brothers and, and Fractech, uh, you know, we could, I think we could count all the, the academic articles from the Wilkes brothers on, on, uh, fingers of two hands. You know, this is Halliburton, Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, trying to, uh, show the world that they are in fact, uh, the gatekeepers as it were to this really productive and influential technology. Uh, but they have to switch out of this kind of advertising signaling game as they, face greater and greater uh, competition in the form of entry and they try to switch the patents. Uh, one of the takeaways that, that we have from this is the service companies certainly act like they thought they had an edge. And then they became very conscious that they were facing increased entry uh, and tried to change strategies in a way to um, hold on to that edge. It didn't work out as well as it might have. Um, as the, the title to the webinar says, it's, it's a fracking new world. I just wanna um, highlight three points before I hand this back to Chuck and he can, he can take off and, and, and run with it. Yeah, Schlumberger, as of the beginning of the year, has exited the domestic frack market. So one of these three large occupant firms has basically said it's not worth it for us to play in this uh, more competitive market, domestic market. Uh, Halliburton exited Oklahoma, uh, one of the most competitive states, uh, one of the most active states, lots of uh, unconventional wells being, being drilled and, and fractured there. Uh, so there's the, the two biggest uh, firms have, have kind of said, well, gee, it was a nice run for 20 years, but, but we're gonna, um, not focus on this as a core business. The third point I'd make is that the, the idea that frack spreads are as interchangeable as drilling rigs. And we might not think that all drilling rigs are perfect substitutes, right? I mean, Ryan Kellogg had a nice paper in which he showed that there can be these pairwise uh, experiential gains within partnerships. We might think that there's a similar sort of thing for, for frack spreads. Um, and, and that's sort of corroborated by, I think a lot of the emphasis in the industry now is on above ground logistics and other productivity factors more than the input substitution uh, kinds of questions that initially attracted 
economists, but uh, you're seeing rig counts quoted right alongside frac spreads, um, at least at least for the United States. And uh, I think that'll uh, wrap up what I have to say. I'm going to turn it over to Chuck to talk a little bit more about some of the international implications. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, so. But I'm, I'm going to take about 10 minutes uh, to, to wander through this international implication material. And then after that, we'll, we'll have a, a chunk of time left over for, for Q&A. So the, the summary, right, the summary story from the US is that this new technology has really been uh, a game changer. It's, product, it's productive, uh, it unlocks resources heretofore uh, beyond reach. And it really kind of raises a question of a broader deployment. How about other places in the world? What about other countries? And we're gonna spend a little bit of time here talking about one particular country, that's Argentina, in, in large measure because they have some quite large uh, shale gas type gas reserves, uh, shale gas, shale oil type, type uh, oil and gas reserves in the Vaca Muerte deposit. Uh, it is an example of what we might think of as a developing country that has the potential to use this resource for good effect for their, uh, for the national economy, maybe generate extra monies. Uh, Argentina in particular could really use a financial shot in the arm these days. And this uh, material I wanna talk about here, this is uh, taken in, in some part from the paper that Tim uh, referred to in passing the environment development economics piece uh, that's forthcoming, published online, uh, but, but not published in paper just yet. So here I'm showing you a, a time series plot. This is based on data that uh, is publicly available, but not uh, conveniently available from the Argentine government. Uh, and so we downloaded this and, and translated it into or translated the kind of the supporting information uh, into English. We have here a, a time series plot of production from the Vaca Muerta and, uh, and nearby fields, shale gas production and type gas production. And, and one kind of big message from this is that prior to say 2013, 2014, there wasn't a whole lot going on um, Tight gas production really took off after 2014 and then kind of plateaued 16, 17, 18, at which point uh, shale gas production has really increased quite dramatically. And these are big increases. So uh, uh, this is, um, you know, kind of like a three or four fold increase in available reserves. Uh, now, with this increase in available deposits in proven exploitable reserves comes increase in production that one might wonder where does this go uh, and how exactly do the Argentines uh, benefit from this. So here I'm going to show you side by side to, to try and make this point two plots. The, the one here that will be to the left is production annual uh, uh, production and the one on the right is exports. And, and the one kind of big takeaway message here, even though the exports uh, billion cubic feet uh, kind of bounce around for a little while, 2019 marks the point at which they really start to increase quite dramatically. Not long after you've seen this big increase in production. So I think the story that makes sense here is that the increased production sort of filled up uh, available channels for distribution domestically and then started to bleed over into uh, exported circles. So there's uh, there are increases in domestic consumption that come from this and the benefits that follow therefrom and increases in exports, again, generating benefits. So you can see why there's something attractive in here uh, for, uh, for just sort of the, the government for the day-to-day -day, uh, lives of the citizens in in Argentina. So this is by way of a backstory. To unlock these deposits requires a partnership. For the most part, these partnerships entail the uh, national company, national oil company of Argentina, 
uh, YPF and big players like Chevron on the production side. And then they have to find somebody to do the frack jobs. And thinking about the uh, kind of the, the evolution of the fracking of the service industry as detailed in, in Tim's part of this tale, there, there's this sort of, uh, there sort of two prong uh, question that I think comes up. One is how important uh, are market concentration considerations to the extent that, uh, that, uh, that this is a tight, a tightly concentrated industry, or if we think about that, that slice of the service industry that would be likely to help with the uh, extraction of uh, tight oil and gas, who gets the rents from, from these deposits? How much of this goes to the service companies? How much of it stays in country? And then finally, how, how does intellectual property fit into all of this? And importantly, then if you think of intellectual property as commanding rents, this would suggest a, a need for some kind of a distribution that's at least uh, broadly attractive to the service companies. So uh, I wanna end off by, by making the case that, that even though Argentina seems to be a world apart, there's actually an interesting parallel to what we might see in, um, as Tim pointed out, a, a place that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, Sublette County in Wyoming. So here I'm, I'm showing you a time series of completions, well completions, in the Vaca Muerte, which is the dark line, and in Sublette County, Wyoming, which is the dashed line. And prior to say 2014, there was a pretty clear difference, but really after that, and particularly after 2016, there's a really interesting, remarkable uh, parallel between these. I don't know that you would have naturally necessarily expected there to be this sort of strong parallel. So for me, the takeaway message is that, that fracking is really maturing in Argentina. Uh, and so these questions that we're raising within the context of this new work have pretty clear implications for other parts of the world to the extent that you're gonna see uh, fracking deployed elsewhere. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and we're going to turn to the Q&A. Um, and so right now we have uh, only this question about who picked the music. Tim, did you build a buttercup? <laughs> Uh, my my musical tastes would probably have been turned down, um, so. I'll okay. Just say that. <laughs> well, we we have um, we have a little bit of uh, of flex in this, and I think there was some extra stuff that Tim wanted to talk about. So, since there are no questions right now, do you want to do you want to add that stuff in? Yeah, let me see if I can pull it up here. While you're doing this, do you want me to fill the gap? Yeah, you can you can narrate over it while I okay pull, pull, pull this uh, right. up. So let me let me just do this then. I'm going to add in. Um, I want to show two graphs from this uh, this working paper that that we based a chunk of this talk off of. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how important the big three service companies were. I want to spend just a little bit of time drawing the contrast between service companies and independent operators. So I'm going to show you two graphs. The first one is the Journal Petroleum Technology articles and the second one are patents. This one is, is a pretty clear indication that especially after 2009, 2000, uh, 2008, 2009, the publication channel is being used uh, to a pretty large extent by service companies, which as we noted a moment ago was mainly the, the big three and not so much by independent operators. So this isn't to say that independent operators don't possess uh, intellectual 
property. They just aren't using publication as a means of disseminating that information. And perhaps because they haven't got uh, any motivation to do so. If you, if you buy the advertising angle, the service companies do. But the second uh, graph that I wanna show is patents. And here I really think this draws a pretty dramatic picture. So this is number of patents is the line with the triangles and the dashed line with the squares is independent operators. And it's pretty clear here that operators aren't patenting and service companies are after 2014. So to the extent that we might imagine that intellectual property is being held by independent operators uh, and not by service companies, this question, this, this graph really kind of poses uh, uh, a difficult set of facts to explain. I, my view on this would be that most of the actions come from service companies. So Tim, are you ready to roll? Uh, yeah, I'm actually gonna answer this question about uh, talking about horizontal and directional drilling because I, I may have kind of glossed over this a little bit, uh, but there's, there's a question about whether we can separate uh, the development of hydraulic fracturing from directional and horizontal drilling because getting into shales and economically exploiting them required both. Uh, and so I completely agree with that. I mean, uh, and I would, I think I'd, I'd make three points about it. Uh, I talked about the creation myth of, of fracturing uh, from, from Mitchell Energy. Those are all vertical wells. And it was, it was really only after Mitchell got bought out by Devon, who had been messing around with a lot of horizontal drilling, um, that the kind of, the, kind of the, the two went together that you could, you could drill horizontally and fracture. Uh, so so that's, that is an important innovation. Second point I would make is how that gets dealt with in this kind of learning and tracking literature is two, two things happen mechanically in the econometric studies. One is uh, the sort of the well bore is normalized. So you're, you're kind of thinking about how much, um, how, how much material you're pumping down the well bore per perforated foot. So you're, you're really trying to, you know, think about, you know, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna end up perforating, you know, 3000 feet of well bore, uh, then I'm going to normalize all of those inputs by that amount of exposed well bore. Um, because if we had a, a horizontal well with a two mile lateral versus a one mile lateral, it might look like just twice as big uh, of a frack. Uh, the, the, the other thing that happens in those studies is you separate out uh, directional, horizontal, vertical wells and you can do categorical analyses. Um, the problem is for, for most of the existing studies kind of looking back, there's so much more um, fracturing activity in horizontal wells and in directional wells that people basically just kind of ignore the, uh, because that's where all the data is, they just sort of specify that this is what happens in um, the development of hydraulic fracturing within horizontal or, or directional wells. Um, so so that, that's a, a, a really uh, fine point. The third point I would make in, in kind of response to that, because I think it's a great question, is there, there are other technologies besides just drilling, right? I mean, you think, you think about the ability to have complementary micro seismic, and you think about the ability to have um, monitoring while drilling technologies, all of which allow um, you know, more precise geosteering and more uh, precision in application of, of the fracturing technology. Um, what we've done in, in, in the work we've done to this point, we've, we've really just kind of focused on, um, on just the fracturing piece of that. I mean, I think there's a bigger nut to crack there. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, but we definitely acknowledge the importance of the complementary drilling technologies as well. Okay, so um, William Jackson has another question here that kind of points to the difference between uh, Wyoming, well, let's just say in general, geographic differences of the, of the, the nature of this process. 
And this is, this is really a, a good question that um, I think we've spent a big amount of time thinking through what, what is it that differs, if anything, between Wyoming and, and say the uh, areas that are embodied by the Marcellus, Pennsylvania in particular. How do you explain these big differences in the findings between um, Feder et al. And, and our work? And I think, uh, I guess I'll, I'll give a quick answer and then Tim looks like he's chomping at the bit to, to pitch something in. I think there's two things um, that, that enter into this. They're both sort of geographic in nature. One is that um, the geology is quite different in the two areas. Uh, in particular, I think Wyoming's geology is, is more challenging than, than many others. Uh, and the second is, uh, if you like, proximity to something like a national market. I think perhaps easier to relocate a, a drilling rig from, let's say, the Southwest Texas, Louisiana to Pennsylvania uh, than it is to Western Wyoming. Um, and just, just for the record here, uh, to underscore that point, um, I don't know if it's, if it's open now, but all weekend I-80 across Southern Wyoming has been closed because we had a monster blizzard come through. Um, Tim. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great answer. I would add uh, two details. Uh, so it turns out Sublette County, Wyoming is basically a gas province. It's not an oil province. Uh, and so the, the difference in product may matter. It doesn't particularly matter in that particular comparison. Uh, and there, so that's point one. The, the geologies are different. Um, and, and there's a, a whole kind of dispute about a horse race between technology and, and geological information. There are a couple of papers that, that try to think about the relative value of uh, really understanding geology or being able to sort of tweak uh, the inputs. And I, I think that's actually still an open and, and, and very relevant and interesting question. Um, the second point I would make is that, you know, there are clearly two waves of application of hydraulic fracturing as it, as it rolled out. The first was very gas oriented. Gas prices were high in the early 2000s. Um, there was concern that oil molecules were going to be too big to fit in fractures. Um, and so there, there was just a, a big push into places like uh, Haynesville Shale and the Barnett. Um, later, you know, as I think operators and service companies realized they the oil molecules weren't too big. They could target oil rich provinces. You saw the, the plays shift a little bit. Um, and I'm not, I am not aware of, you know, massive differences in um, the formulation of fracks, of input choice, say for fracks uh, in oil versus gas provinces. Um, you know, you kind of have to think about controlling for the, the different geology. And uh, I think you'd have to do a little bit of a different kind of study to try to think about that diffusion into a, into a new product target space. Okay, so we have, uh, we have another question here, which um, I'm gonna say this is sort of a, a bedrock existential question. Why haven't the service companies taken over the whole drilling and production space? Um, I have a, I have an answer to that, Tim, but if you want to take a crack at that first, I, I hold off, or if you want me to, I can go for this. You go ahead. Okay. So there's a there's sort of a broad conceptual question. This is an, an old time industrial organization question about vertical integration. Uh, imagine that you have an industry where there are two firms that are vertically related, as, as is the case right here. Over the I, think Chuck, I think you froze there for a second, Chuck, so, so just repeat that. Okay, sorry. Might have, might have some issues at my end. Uh, so 
this is this is what I'm saying is this is an old time IO question about vertical relationships. Does the upstream firm extend its market down, downstream, gobbling up the downstream firm, or does the downstream firm gobble up the upstream firm, or do we not have mergers and we just sort of persist with this vertical relationship? And in this particular instance, I, I suspect that the answer is that the upstream firms weren't large enough individually to attract the attention of the service companies. Uh, but, but, it is, but it is an interesting teaser of a question. Why, why don't you see merger activity here? Tim, you have anything to say here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the model of the, especially the big three service companies as sort of turnkey service companies to start. I mean, they they felt like they had uh, prov provided a sufficient scope of services that everybody was going to have to go through them. Uh, I think what they what they didn't count on was the entry into servicing. They were quite content to, you know, if you if you, if you went back say ten years or fifteen years. You know, Schlumberger and Halliburton were sort of coming out every year with a new frac fluid, and oh, this is a green one. If you're worried about your your ESG, uh, hey, you know, you can use our new green frac fluid, and it, by the way, it's got a stupendous markup on it. And they, they were quite happy with that niche, and it, then suddenly you had two oil price shocks in 2008 and 2014, and operators demanded lower servicing costs and that was delivered by low cost entrance um, and and the, the next thing those the, the big service companies knew they were um, trying to hang on to the business they thought they had and they tried to play this intellectual property game in order to do that rather than than trying to vertically integrate even more through the supply chain Okay, we have, we have uh, one more question that's come in about uh, the generalizability of this material. Can, can we say something about other industries? And so I'm, I'm just going to take that to mean a, an energy industry in which there's a, an important vertical relation where there are things to be learned and one of the two segments. Is the focus of this learning and the distribution of information and, and what what if anything do our results have to say about that and I, i'm just going to say one of the things that i think is really most intriguing about this particular example the the fracking example is that the service companies seem to have used publications as a method of advertising which i suspect gave them short-term gains but also kind of hatched the natural competition, which meant that over the course of time, their market share eroded. And there's some really intriguing dynamic, uh, if you like static versus dynamic trade-offs that, uh, that this example points to. Um, and I could imagine the same sorts of things might come up, particularly in industries where innovation is, is important and, and rapidly emerging. And this could be things like battery, technology, this could be things like hydrogen, this could be things uh, like uh, big improvements in, in solar or wind. Uh, and um, I suspect that there are some, some lessons that could be grafted into these other uh, industrial lines of, of operation. Uh, Tim, you have something you want to add to this? Yeah, I would, I would add one thing. I think, I think, you know, fracking is really interesting in this, it's transformative technology that comes along and, and nobody owns the patent on it, right? And so it's just sort of in the public domain and it gets adopted very quickly in the, the early 2000s. Um, and, I, and I think the implication of that is that the social welfare gains are larger, right? Because this, we don't have to go through a patent troll. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to worry about infringing on property. And there's this sort of very open, and maybe less open as time goes on, uh, innovation and cross pollination that goes on and, and delivers, you know, first low gas prices and then low oil prices, and that's a boon for uh, consumers. Um, and depending on how we think about 
uh, negative externalities associated with production is, is probably net positive for um, for society. If we want to think about some other technology, and and I think you know electric vehicles, batteries, other electric uh, technologies, I, I don't see that same sort of open uh, IP architecture that fracking had, and so I'm a little bit less optimistic that we'll be able to uh, capture immediate or, or rapid social welfare gains. Um, that's just a kind of a thought. Pointing to the interesting ambiguity here. That's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a worthwhile question to investigate. Um, I don't see any other questions. So I think this might be a, a judicious time to hand back to you, Dave. Thank you, thank you, Chuck. I'll tell you, if there's one thing for certain, this topic is not going away, <laughs> uh, particularly here in the state. So um, uh, we thank you very much. We thank uh, Tim, uh, both of your time and your expertise. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope you'll come back uh, and visit us uh, uh, maybe in a quarter or a half and uh, bring us up to speed with uh, other research that you're doing in this space. So. With that in mind, I thank uh, all of our listeners that have been with us today, as well as remind that this will be available on our Rewind station for those that uh, cannot participate in the live event. It will be posted and uh, available later on today. I thank you for attending and I officially close this webinar.